Welcome to Anchors of Truth, live from the 3ABN Worship Center, the Unclean Spirit Series with John Lomacang. Hello and welcome to the 3ABN Worship Center and the Seventh-day Adventist Church here in Thompsonville slash West Frankfort, Illinois. Thank you for joining us as you do each and every day. And today this is a live program, so there are people we know that you're watching from around the world. If you're just joining us this morning, we want you to call your friends, your loved ones, your enemies, everybody. Tell them that Pastor John Loma King is going to be bringing us a wonderful, he is bringing us a wonderful series. And today he's going to continue that series with the sermon entitled Walk of Fame. And uh, I've, been, I've been able to watch the last couple on television, but it's better being here. I have to admit, I like being here, though it's wonderful on television. So if you're in a viewing area and you're driving distance possibly, you want to come and continue. There's going to be a program at 2 o'clock Central Time uh, this afternoon also. But I want to say just a word for Pastor, about Pastor John Loma King. I've known him for a number of years, he and his wife Angie. Wonderful people. They're dedicated, have given their lives. They're literally not just a ministry, but their whole lives to the cause of God. And that's to finishing the work that Jesus commissioned all of us to do. He said, go ye into all the world. And uh, John and Angie take that seriously. They not only speak um, 3ABN around the world, but they literally travel around the world. Recently coming back from Africa, they go to so many places and are a blessing to so many people. So we're asking for uh, a special prayer for John and Angie. And I want to, I'm saying the two because they're a team, husband and wife team. And so we so appreciate them and we appreciate the series. When 3ABN started 20, over 26 years ago, when we had the impression to build a television station to reach the world, this was a dream. So what we're seeing today is a dream come true, the anchors of truth. We can give the truth to a lost and dying world. Time is short. We may not be able to do this forever. With all the law, there are countries right now you cannot get up and preach about Jesus and him crucified. You can't do it. Uh, it's amazing that what the events that are happening around the world and we're all familiar with what just happened in Japan and what is continuing to happen over there and it's it, we see that time is short and Jesus is coming very soon but what a privilege it is and I want to thank all of you watching today for your love and your prayers and financial support of 3ABN as we continue to take this gospel of the kingdom into all the world today we want to say just a special prayer and I invite the Holy Spirit to be here with us and to especially anoint Pastor Loma King as he speak, speaks to us. Heavenly Father, thank you again for your many wonderful blessings. Thank you, Lord, for this another beautiful Sabbath day that we can worship you. And Though it's sunshiny outside, we're thankful for that. But even when it's rainy and cold, it's still sunshine in our hearts because we know the S-O-N, the sun. And so thank you, Father, for hearing, for answering prayers. And thank you most of all for loving us loving us and making a plan of salvation where each and every person on planet earth has the opportunity to live and rule and reign with you forever. Lord, thank you for 3ABN, for this opportunity, for this tool that you have given us to literally take this gospel into all the world. Today, we're asking a special anointing, double outpouring of the anointing of the Holy Spirit upon Pastor John Loma King as he brings us anchors of truth today. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thank you, Danny. Good morning, everyone. And a happy Sabbath to you. I know it's a beautiful Sabbath day. It's spring almost is here. But whether spring gets here or not, or how it gets here is not really the issue today. The Lord is here. That's really what matters. And we want to thank you for coming out. And those of you joining us, uh, whether internet or radio or television or whatever media medium that you may use, we welcome you again to the fourth part in a five-part series. The overreaching title is Unclean Spirits. But uh, we also know that there are some individual titles. Today it's in, about the Walk of Fame. And if you're joining us for the first time, I want to encourage you to find out as the series is done uh, whether you could see it viewed again or maybe even get in touch with 3ABN to get copies of the DVD. I think it is their intention and I'm going to actually suggest that we put this in a DVD form so that people can have it in their own possession. And uh, this is just, I believe, if I had time to do even more, five more presentations, maybe in the future I could do a part two to this because there's so much 
that uh, my mind sometimes kind of is like a car at a four-way intersection. Which way do I turn? But God has given me wisdom and direction and also strength to communicate what he has to his honor and his glory. Uh, this morning is entitled A Walk of Fame. We started out with the revealing on, on Wednesday, then we went to It Did Not Come From God. And last night was about mixed signals. I hope you had a chance to tune into that. Today is about the Walk of Fame. What actually happens on the Walk of Fame? And this afternoon, the title that we're going to end with is Born Again. What actually does that mean when it comes to the music industry? And I'm primarily talking about the music industry, you know, rock, hip-hop, uh, country music. Uh, but when you go to the entertainment industry in general, it is everywhere. Satan has made a contract with anyone who wants to be on board. As it comes to fame and fortune, that's temporary. But um, I'm looking forward to being on board with Jesus because there's a larger picture than this one that God wants to show us. But um, Danny has prayed, but I always like to ask the Lord to give me direction and guide my mind. So let's bow our heads together. Heavenly Father, this is your opportunity. You've given me the opportunity, Father, to stand here as a vessel molded by the influence of your Holy Spirit. And so, Lord, today, use my mouth and my mind and my heart to give you glory and honor. I pray in Jesus' precious name. Amen. I want to begin with a text that really means a lot to me. Matthew 16, verse 26. And if you have your Bibles, you could turn there. I would encourage you to take notes. But if you don't have either one of those, it's on the screen. And I want to thank our guys, our wonderful media team here. They just do such a good job, the production team for 3ABN. Praise the Lord for their desire to be professional. Matthew 16, verse 26 reads as follows. We've read this before, but as I study, it really hits home. What... For what profit is it to a man if he gains how much? The whole world and loses his own soul. Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? When Angie and I lived in Northern California, we had taken a trip to Southern California one day and were just driving around uh, in the Los Angeles area and we came upon a long line of stretch limousines, black limousines, white limousines, and uh, they all had blackened windows. And so that sparked our interest, and we decided to find out what this was all about. So we decided to follow these limousines where they were headed, and we ended up in front of a large, large theater. And outside there was a long red carpet with a huge crowd. Well, naturally, we wanted to get a glimpse of the famous people. The problem was, all their limousine windows were black, double black. And uh, we looked as intently as we could, hoping to see someone. All of a sudden, all of a sudden, one of the windows began to be rolled down, but just a few inches. And all we saw was somebody's forehead. Well, you know... The devil got the best of us, and we decided to resort to the sour grape excuse, which is, you know, we didn't want to see him anyway. You know that when you can't reach something, it's a sour grape. So we just fell into the sour grape, and that thing really got to us. All those famous people, all that money, all the flashing of the cameras, all the red carpet. And, you know, sometimes we see that, and we kind of want to get a taste of that. But on the way home, ba driving back to Northern California, the Lord got a hold of me, Danny. The Lord got a hold of me. And he reminded me why the new Jerusalem is going to have transparent glass, not blackened walls. And I heard his voice say to me, John, you're trying to look through their glass to see what you miss. But one day they will look through your glass to see what they miss. <laughs> one day there's going to be another long red carpet the carpet is going to be made red by the blood of the Lamb. There's going to be a larger crowd than Hollywood could, ever, Hollywood could ever amass. Farther than any eye can see. And then we will be invited in to get our rewards. But when you're on the sidelines, it seems like the world has chosen the best path. 
It brings them temporarily everything that sometimes we desire. And I think at the top of that list is we all want the money they have, which brings the possessions they have. And we forget sometimes that a man's life truly does not consist in the abundance of the things he possesses. Somebody once said, money doesn't buy happiness. And I remember hearing that and I said, well, I wish somebody would give me a chance to decide that for myself. <laughs> it really doesn't buy happiness, but it sure doesn't hurt to be very honest about it. But money is not the highest goal. But in this world, it seems like it. I mean, you think about your light bill, your phone bill, your television bill, your gas bill, your car bill, anything that breaks down your clothing, your food. Everything in this world seems to orbit around money. Money is a powerful God. And that's the reason why Jesus said what he did in Matthew 6 and verse 24. He says... No one can serve how many masters? Two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and what? You cannot serve God and mammon. I'm a marriage counselor also, and I heard a story where uh, a man, when he went to get counseling, uh, the, the, the counselor said, what's the problem? And he talked about his wife. He said, nobody can serve two masters. He was torn between two women. This is not about being torn between two women. This is about being torn between two worlds. The world that God presents and the world that Satan presents. But when you follow that word mammon, you, be, you become uh, familiar with the fact that mammon was also another name for Beelzebub. The Satan, the dark lord, Beelzebub, because truly the love of money is the root of all evil. Don't ever say that money is the root of all evil. The love of money is the root of all evil. We all need money in this world. We need to have that. I remember there was a time when you can walk into a, a place and put down cash, but nowadays it seems like cash is not as accepted as credit cards. And everybody puts you in a category. You have to have a credit rating even to get a job nowadays in some places. The world has so fit the picture that we have to fit into its mold. But as you begin to look at this, there should be a difference before and after we come to Jesus. I mean, I believe that there ought to be a difference in our lives. Who we are before and after fame, when you look at the music industry, the entertainment industry, who we are before and after are diametrically or diametrically opposite. It's different. Polarized in two different directions. But when you look at the Bible, you begin to see, as you study this thing, you begin to see that there truly are two roads. How many roads did I say? There really are two roads. And these two roads go in opposite directions. I mean, there really are two roads. The wise man said it this way, Proverbs 16, 25. He said, there is a way that what? Seems right to a man, to a man, but its end is the way of what? Death. Its end is the way of death. I mean, the devil has a contract, and I've, I've signed contracts before, as one person just said to me this morning, and I appreciate that. Matter of fact, I'll go ahead and give him props. My good friend Jay Christian said, you know, when you think about that, when you sign a contract, whether it's a credit card contract or, or a mortgage contract or whatever you buy, if you have to sign on the dotted line, you are committed after that whether you want to be or not. When you make a contract with the devil, you are his, whether you want to be or not. And he's worse than the mafia. You just don't get out. You don't get out unscathed, but I also want to say this, the Lord can deliver, can deliver anybody who wants to be delivered. But when you're in it, it is so captivating. It is so, um, what's the word I can use here, alluring. It is so mesmerizing. It just seems like it reaches into your soul and, and touches everything that is carnal about us. That's why the industry is so large. But we've got to make a decision, and the Lord makes it easy for us. Look at Deuteronomy 30 and verse 19. The Lord makes it easy for us. He gives us two choices. He doesn't say pick one, but listen to what he says. I call heaven and earth as witness today against you. That I have set before you life and death. Blessing and what else? Cursing. And I know I like this. He doesn't say pick one. He says what? 
choose life that both you and your descendants may live. I believe one of the reasons why families are breaking apart from generation to generation to generation is that the father and mother go down the worldly course and the children go down the worldly course. In many of our homes today, the reason why children are the way they are is because the parents are the way they are. The reason why children listen to what they do is because parents listen to what the chi children listen to what the parents listen to. And then parents, when the children get older, they say, where did I go wrong? Where do they go wrong? If you trace it back, you'll always see that there was a line where they turned off of the right road and they thought that their children would grow out of evil. But children don't grow out of evil. They grow into evil. It's the natural inclination. It's the natural course. Just like the sun always leans toward the tree, just like flowers always turn their faces to the sun, children that are not born again, they turn their faces toward darkness. They turn their faces toward evil. They want it their way. But once again, the Lord makes it clear to us that there's a right way and there's a wrong way. And the wrong way seems to be larger than the right way. Look at Matthew chapter 7, verse 13 and 14. We're going to get to some graphics here in just a moment about pictures and all the other things that you look forward to. But let's go to the Bible. I think it's important to build on the Bible. What do you say? Amen. Matthew 7, verse 13 and 14. I can't preach sermons without using the Bible. The Lord once again gives us direction. And with all this direction, I wondered to myself, how is it that people can be raised in the church and be lost anyhow? With all this direction God gives to us. He says, enter by the what gate? narrow gate or straight gate for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to what destruction and there are many who go in by it because narrow is the gate and difficult is the way which leads to life and there are few who find it let me just put it this way I rather have difficulty in this life and ease in eternity than the other way around. Ease in this life and difficulty as it pertains to eternity. I'd rather barely get by now and have all the provision that God has in store for me for eternity. But we are so short-sighted short sometimes. Somebody comes along and suggests something that sounds good to us and like a, and like a, a, a horse with, with a, a bridle in his mouth, he twists and turns us in whatever direction he tugs the string. Like a marionette puppet, he only allows us to go in the direction he swings us. That's why, as a native New Yorker, if you go to New York or Detroit or Chicago or Los Angeles, if you want to find the place where the lights are bright and the action is heavy and the attractions are abundant, go to Broadway. Go to Broadway. Every city has a Broadway. In the small towns, we call it Main Street. Now, you know, in West Frankfort, Main Street cannot compare to Broadway in New York City. But if you go to Broadway in New York City, the reason why it is designed the way it is, is for sensory overload. The reason why Las Vegas is loud and bright is for sensory overload. You don't get a chance to think. What you think and what you do and what you listen to and what you smell, people are coming at you from every direction trying to sell you something. Every, every, every building you walk in, these mega massive palaces of pleasure are all designed to not get you to think, but to get you to react. You see, the devil uses what's on the outside to get us to make decisions on the inside. But the Lord wants to use what's on the inside to protect us from what's on the outside. He said, let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus. The mind that is guarded by the, the principles and the word of God will not be drawn in by the things that are on the outside. But if there's no protection, if there's no guard on the inside, then you have no choice but to be drawn in by what's on the outside. Oh yeah, that's why advertising is so vitally important. It's what's happening on the outside. I remember hearing a song that kind of goes this way. They say the neon lights, the neon lights are bright on Broadway. They say the women treat you fine on Broadway. Then he ends the song, I won't quit till I'm a star on Broadway. 
Well, brethren, I want to be a star on the narrow way. What about you? Because those who aim for the walk of fame often ends up on the walk of shame instead. I mean, there's a contrast between before and after one goes down that road. I'll turn your attention to the screen. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to lead into this before I even ask Will to bring the picture up. You know, a lot of people, a lot of young children, matter of fact, let me talk about girls in particular. A lot of young girls are molded by the young ladies they see in the music and the movie and the television industry. And parents, I said this, and I, this is worth repeating, they put their children in front of a large uh, television screen, and nowadays they really are large, aren't they? See, in our house, large meant uh, 13 inches. Remember that? But nowadays, large means 60 to 75 inches. But they sit in front of these large media uh, boxes and they get their minds molded. And the parents think that as long as they are in the living room watching television, they're safe. Uh-uh. Because you cannot govern and desire or even filter what comes through that screen. Sometimes you're watching the good program and the commercial. You've got to turn away from the commercial. But this young lady I'm about to talk to, about, talk to you about is the young lady that the devil chose many, many years ago to mold the minds of the young girls. But I doubt that they would want to be like her now. Look at the picture. You've heard her. She's been known as Hannah Montana, Miley Cyrus. Probably a nice young lady. But Disney established her as a teen idol. You hear that word, idol? Idol. The Lord warns us against making anything or anybody our idol. Amen. There's a whole program called American Idol. They're trying to find out who you will idolize next. But look at the new Hannah Montana. She went from Hannah Montana, and now she's, this is the Hannah Montana that you don't want your daughter to be. Look at that picture on the right. You still have the one on the left, but this is the new version of her. But now the next slide shows who she is today. This is the new Hannah Montana, dressed like a coven witch, all in black, and the young girls, when they were in their single-digit ages, and one of the Hannah Montana pocketbook and the Hannah Montana doll, Hannah Montana uh, whatever, they, did, they never thought that one day Hannah Montana will make her mind and, and, and establish her allegiance on the dark side. And you know what happened to all those millions of young ladies? They follow her over like the Pied Piper of Hamelin. They follow her from light to darkness, or more specifically, from darkness that they could not perceive to darkness that is now obvious. But look at another one that's in the music industry, gained an applause and a lot of adoring fans, and is one of the biggest artists today. You remember her as the picture on the left. When, when, when Rihanna first started out, she looked like an innocent young lady until she made a decision. After her bout with Chris Brown, she said she wanted to be known as the bad girl. There's her now. You've been following me. You know that that one eye cover is a sign, is one of those signs in the OTO industry, in the occult industry, declaring one's allegiance to the God of darkness, the eye of Horus. They signal each other with progressively plain hints. And we don't know those hints. So people come up to us and, and we, they, they signal us in the industry. And Satan has so designed it that those who are in the industry know the others that are in the industry. Like Adventists, we, we have certain terminologies like um, the investigative judgment. You go out to most places around the world, they think that something happened in the court. Well, it is, but not in the court of earth, but in the court of heaven. We have certain terminologies. We even have certain icons in our church that won't make sense to anybody outside of us. In the music industry, it's the very same way. When Rihanna went down that path, right after her incident with Chris Brown, well, see, a lot of us don't even understand the art of what I would refer to as a distraction or uh, the sleight of hand. You see, when somebody in the, in the entertainment industry uh, goes through a certain trauma, I'm going to talk about that briefly this afternoon. You know, I, I have to stop and say this. I wish I had five more nights. I'm, all, I'm almost, I'm almost uh, lamenting having to bring it to a close this afternoon. And this afternoon, I want to also say this. Uh, my intention is to answer the question, what do we do about it? 
Because I can show you even more gruesome pictures. I can go to the internet and bring out pictures that'll make you hide. But that's not my intention this afternoon. My intention is to give you an answer to what do we do about it? What does the church do? What does the family do? Is there any answer? There's an answer. The answer is Jesus, but I'll give you all the details this afternoon. When Rihanna performed a song by the name of Umbrella, some of you may remember Mary Poppins. That, that supercalifragilisticexpialidocious. But when you look at, well, you, if you go back and you look at Mary Poppins, Mary Poppins was replete with spiritualistic symbols, teaching children how to use magic and how to consult the Dark Lord to get what they wanted instantaneously. As a matter of fact, if you remember that very well, the fastest she said, a super supercalifragilisticexpialidocious, the faster they said it, all of a sudden they said it so fast until a lightning, it, the lightning began to flash and the thunder began to roll because she was conjuring up a response from a demonic angel. But we go around saying stuff not even knowing what it means. That's why in some religious circles they get you to the place where you chant faster and faster and faster and faster. Same thing in the occult world. In the, in the occult world, repetition. That's why Jesus says, "Do not use vain repetition as the heathens do." It's a principle. It's an occultic principle. They work themselves into a frenzy. You remember the story of Elijah on Mount Carmel. All day long, what were they doing? Cutting themselves. If you go and look at the industry of music. There's a lot of self-abuse, a lot of cutting. Why? When you study something called the MK Ultra or the Project Monarch, you'll discover that through old tactics, old CIA tactics, old post-World War II tactics, these were things that were used to break down one's per one person's resistance to becoming a sleeper cell. Or, as the phrase would be, they'll go and they'll, they'll plant themselves in a church or in an organization until they hear a certain word or see a certain picture or hear a certain note or get a certain sound. Satan has so designed it today that there are sleeper cells in the church. I call them young folk that are not converted. I call them old folk that are not converted. People that in their own lives, they are living for the world during the week. So when they come to church on Sabbath morning, religious things don't move them anymore. Go to some of our college campuses. Go to some of our churches where people fall asleep. I know some people are tired. I understand that. But where some people literally, they go to church and they get nothing out of it. Because their minds, they are sleeper cells. They have been communicating with the devil all week long. So by the time they get to church... You sing religious songs and it can't find its way in. Because they only respond to what he has conditioned them. I'm going to talk about that this afternoon. How he has conditioned their minds to respond. That's why the Bible says spiritual things are what? Spiritually discerned. But without that spirit with you all week long, without the Holy Spirit with you all week long, one day a week is not going to help you at all. When Rihanna put out that song entitled Umbrella, the song, if you listen to it, and I don't suggest that young folk go and buy it. That's not what I'm saying. Don't go to iTunes and download it. Somebody ought to say amen. Under, under the supervision of an adult, just look at the words, the lyrics. That song instantly sold nine million units. Nine million units. It was listed as the best selling single worldwide in 2007. 18 out of 29 charts, it was number one. And on every chart that mattered, it was in the top 10 songs. But when you analyze that song, you'll discover that Rihanna was having a dialogue with the devil. And you know what bothers me? This is what young people are listening to. And they say it really is not, it's just that mom is just a song. Dad is just a song. It's in the, you know what, this is something else. I don't have time to go into the classical industry. I don't have time to go into the easy listening industry. I don't have time to go into the country music industry. It's everywhere. Those who are superstars, they have all across every platform. You cannot get access to Satan's stage without signing a contract with the devil. You can't get access. But listen to the words in her song. That makes it very, very clear. These are not words you use when you're talking to a person. 
She said, these fancy things will never come in between because you are part of my entity here for eternity. When last did you call your husband or wife or even your closest friend an entity? Entity is a term used to describe a force that in every case I can think of is not a force for good, but a force for evil. My entity. To further emphasize that during the video, here's a picture of Rihanna taking a picture right in the center of this pyramid, once again declaring her allegiance to the God of Egypt, the God of darkness, the God that gave her fame and gave her fortune. And you know what gets me? Millions of young people are buying that stuff every day. Well, you know, you've heard the phrase, there's a devil in the detail, or the devil's in the detail. For those of you who don't even know who Rihanna is, let me take you back to somebody that you know about. Because some of you may say, well, you know, I don't care about Rihanna. I don't care about these rap and hip-hop artists. I'm not, I'm not in that vein of music. Let me take some of you that are older a little further back so you can see this is not something new. Let's go back to somebody that you may have heard of, a man by the name of Barry Manilow. He performed a song. He didn't write it. It was written by a man by the name of Bruce Johnson. But if you listen to the lyrics in the song, and I've chosen some of them, you'll begin to see that Satan has been doing this for years. Look at the lyrics. I've been alive forever, and I wrote the very first song. I put the words and the melodies together. I am music, and I write the songs. My home lies deep within you, and I've got my own place in your soul. Now, when I look out through your eyes, I am young again, even though I'm very old. Look at this. Oh, my music makes you dance, gives you spirit to take a chance. And I wrote some rock and roll so you can move. Music fills your heart. Well, that's a real fine place to start. It's from me, it's for you. It's from you, it's for me. It's a worldwide symphony. The devil has people singing on their way to destruction. So if it sounds soft and easy listening, don't think that it's not without some strings attached. Examine it. And now let me go ahead and be balanced here because some people may say, now, can I listen to anything? There are some good songs out there. Somebody ought to say amen. There's some nice music out there. But in many cases, when you buy a CD or when you start listening to records, you don't say, well, I'm going to listen to that song, but not that song. I'm going to listen to that. You know, you kind of take the whole kit and caboodle together. It's like a dinner when you go to potluck. You may not eat everything, but everything is there to choose from. So you've got to be really careful nowadays. That's why I kind of I kinda take my hat off to iTunes, because nowadays you can pick the song you want and leave the one you don't. But still, I don't glorify the industry at all. But what you have to keep in mind is demonic influence is not accidental. Take rock music, for example. There's only one purpose for rock music, and that's the glorification of Satan. Alistair Crowley's influence added greater presence to the satanic influence. Look at this picture very quickly. You may not have seen this before, this before but this is something Alistair Crowley created called the unicursal hexagram. You go to the next graphic, you'll discover what is a part of this. This, this hexagram has 11 points. On the outer, f six points. In the center, a five-leaf clover, 11 points. What on earth does that mean? Before I give you the definition, let me just tell you this. You see, there's a hexagram, but a hexagram, or a pentagram, I should say, has how many sides? Penta, how many sides? Five. Pentagram, pentagon, five sides. As a matter of fact, this doesn't really, I'm not going to talk about this, but it's amazing how the pentagon fits perfectly in the center of the pentagram. Let's not go there right now. But in, in occultism and in other uh, genres of life, like in Middle Eastern and Hinduism and, and Indian philosophies, this, uh, this has a very significant meaning. Let me go ahead and read to you what this is all about. And I, you could look at the screen as I break the definition down. This is from Wikipedia, the free encyclopedia. It says, the unir cursal hexagram placed a five-petal rose symbolizing the divine in the center, the symbol as a whole making 11, five petals of the rose plus six points of the hexagram. Thought by some as the number of 
divine union. Remember, Aleister Crowley wanted a union with the source. The source, by the way, is not God. The source is someone called Corazon or a demon that he gets in touch with when he crosses the abyss. It's amazing. In the use in the Greek and Hindu mythologies as a symbol of dedication to the divine ruler. In other words, Aleister Crowley designed this so that those who use this will publicly declare their commitment to a divine ruler. But not the divine ruler we're thinking about, but a divine ruler that he has established. I don't even have time to talk about crossing into the abyss, but you know anything that's associated with the abyss is demonic. But look at this graphic here. I think this is where it is. Let me, let me not go ahead of myself. I, I think this may be it, but let me just go ahead and read. Um, yeah, this is the one. Here it is. This is a picture of a unicursal hexagram used in a rock concert. I want you to get that. This is a rock concert. And you'll notice that the singer, look as demonic as he wants to be, he's singing through this, this uh, unicursal hexagram. Well, the reason why he's singing through this is the unicursal hexagram is also a part of the musical paraphernalia used in rock concerts to channel their message with more satanic potency. In other words, they say, the, the pentagram is not strong enough. I know it's a, it's a symbol of Satan, the five-point star, whether upside down or right side up, but they said, Alice Crowley is saying, remember, he doesn't want to be just associated, he doesn't really want to be lightly acquainted with Satan, he wanted to be, in his own words, Satan's chief of staff. So he did things to hype up his connection to make it more potent. In other words, if you took drugs from Aleister Crowley, it was not the basic hit, quote unquote, that you take from a person that's selling drugs on the street. It was they studied ritual use of drugs to literally do you in or break you down. And everything he did, he did 110%. So when he designed this unicursal hexagram, he did that so that it could represent the forces of hell to the tenth power. So when rock groups get this, when you're standing in the audience and I'm quote unquote singing through this, what you don't know is I'm channeling to you entities, demonic forces from hell, and then you go home and you wonder why you can't function. Concerts are worship services for Satan. And I'm talking about worldly concerts. They are worship services for the devil. That's the way he has established it, and that's the way it is. But there's something else that alarmed me that took place in 2009. I talked about the religion of Philema established by Aleister Crowley when he took over the OTO. And by the way, if you're just joining us, the OTO is an organization that's in every state. It's all over the world. It's in every country. OTO means Ordo Templi Orientis or the order of the temple of the east, or the order of the, uh, the, uh, the oriental templars. This is an organization that its main cause is to give you all the tools you need to get in contact with a deity to discover your will. The deity is not a godly deity. Discover your will and live out your own will. Jesus says, not my will, but yours be done. Alistair Crowley says, not God's will, but yours be done. Jesus gave his will to the molding of his father. Alistair Crowley is saying, no, let me give the devil the job to help you mold your will. You find out what you want to do, and Satan will help you accomplish that. And the entire music and entertainment industry is going down that road. But something happened in 2009 that really, if Alistair Crowley were alive, he would be laughing to the highest heaven. Look at this quotation. In May 2009... Thelema was recognized by Her Majesty's Court Service in the UK as a religion. This is as satanic as it can get. As it has both a quote-unquote holy book, this is what the court has recognized, the book of the law that Aleister Crowley wrote as he was inspired by Iwas, that ancient Nephilim spirit from satanic Egypt. And also goes on, the book of the law, and deity primarily for the purpose of the oath knew it as required in law. Now, I don't have time to even get into that, but knew it. They believe that there are three powerful gods, and knew it for them is one of the most powerful. In other words, 
If you had somebody that or on the level of friends, you say, well, my friend, this guy, is, this guy has money, this guy is wealthy, this guy is mega wealthy. Knew it would be the one that's mega wealthy, the one that can give you more power than you can ever imagine as it pertains to satanic things. They were able to stand in the court and convince the courts that the book of the law, a satanic Bible, is a holy book. Now do you wonder why many churches in, in England have turned into pubs? That's another word for bars. Many of those churches are now clubs where they dance for the devil instead of worship the Lord God Almighty. Satan has taken over many of these cultures, not just in the UK. I don't want to just bang on that nation alone. But in the music industry, religion is at the base. Religion is at the base. But their religion is a cult-based borrowing from ancient pagan symbolizations. But there's something else that uh, we often don't catch. I want you to read this and then I'll show you what I'm talking about. Daniel 3 and verse 1. Look at this. Nebuchadnezzar the king made an image of gold whose height was 60 cubits and it's with what? 60 cubits. He set it up in the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. He made an image of what, friends? An image of gold. In other words, we call this the golden man. Where do you think the entertainment industry got the idea from for the image awards? Golden image. Look at this picture. The Oscar. Now, I don't know if it's just me, but the Oscar looks like that golden man from the plain of Dura in Babylon. And I, I hate to say it, I wouldn't be kissing that. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven images. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them nor serve them. You know what? If the best you can get is a golden image. Has eyes, but it can't see. Ears, but it can't hear. Hands, but it can't touch. Feet, but it can't walk. They just say to you, here, put this on your shelf and go home and get happy. The Lord have mercy, you not only do everything you can just to get this golden image, but brethren, that's all the reward you're going to get. You cannot gain heaven if you are in pursuit of a little tiny golden man to put on your shelf. You have to be in pursuit of Jesus. Somebody say amen. But here's the reason why John 12 verse 43, the Lord outlined the reason why people do what they do. He said, for they love the praise of men more than the praise of what? God. When I sing, I don't sing for the praise of men, I sing for the praise of God. Amen. Because I'm going to get my reward one day. I don't need all those awards down here. One day I'm going to get my award from Jesus. That's good enough for me. The Lord also goes on and says to us, now let me just say something before I read this text. There are those who are in this industry that try to justify themselves. But why do they try to justify themselves? Why do we try to justify even participating in that? Here's what Jesus said about it. Luke 16 verse 15. You are those who justify yourselves before men. But God knows what? God knows the heart. For what is highly esteemed among men is an abomination in the sight of God. I don't care if folk don't like for the fact that I stand on true, godly, moral principles. That's where I'm going to stand. Anybody else? And so when you make choices in, your, in this industry, every choice you make either says what you do is an abomination to God or it's something that God esteems. Rock groups are satanic to the core. I would put some pictures on the screen, but you know what? As I looked on the internet to try to get pictures of a rock group, they were too vile to even put on the screen. Most of the people didn't have, hardly have clothing on. And it was designed to just awaken within you the most awful feelings. And I didn't want that in the church. Amen. Amen. I felt bad even putting that in a secular environment. I thought to myself, they're so demonic that if you look at that, that image will stay in your mind too long. I didn't even want to give you that. So you have seen, you, for those of you who have been in that rock industry and know about the rock music and had the rock albums that you got rid of. But I found a couple of images that I feel are not terribly offensive. Look at one, for example. The, the rock group Kiss. Somebody said that's an acronym for Knights in Satan's Service, and that may be true because this group was not chosen by four guys that just like to play different instruments. This group was put together by the, by the 
leader of the church of Satan. They were chosen by the church of Satan's leadership, clergy, the high priest of the church of Satan, so that Satan can get from them all the demonic forces he intends to extract and share with the audience. They made a contract to keep their faces covered. And by the way, that's another reason why we... I want, I want to say so much. I'm going to start talking as fast as a New Yorker. Are you ready? Tune your ears up. Here we go. That's the reason why in churches, people should never do miming. You know what miming is? They paint their faces white or put on white gloves. White gloves just like Michael Jackson. And they do this miming in church. Nowadays, we have miming in churches nowadays, even in Adventist churches. They get that purple light and all of a sudden you can't see folk and... You know, they're doing all this in churches. That is not godly. You follow where that came from. Miming is an old, ancient, middle age, middle ages art. The mimers communicated what they believed, the messages of the dearly departed. And the reason why they had these faces that were white is because their identity was not the issue. It indicated that they were dead to who they are, and they were now living to communicate for the person that has chosen them. That's why these rock groups that paint their faces white... They're communicating for the dark lord Satan. They're not communicating for themselves. That's why it's not important how they look. Because they don't want you to get enamored by who they are. They want you to get enamored by what they sing. That's their job. Here's another one. Marilyn Manson. You've got to get this. You can't see this, but on that cover, he says this phrase. He's the high priest of the, of the church of Satan. He says, we hate love, but we love hate. That's his slogan. And people, young kids, buy that stuff and listen to it. Here's another one, Rolling Stones. Can you be plainer than that? An album cover, Sympathy for the Devil. And look at this next one by uh, that very same group. You have Led Zeppelin to the left, got a picture of the fallen angel. And on, on, on Jay-Z's clothing, he has a clothing line called Rocker Wear, this hip-hop mogul, this 33rd degree mason, Jay-Z, in the one who is married to Beyonce. He has on his clothing line, a uh, friend and foe of the fallen. Even Chris Brown has a song on his CD called Fallen Angel. He sings about this fallen angel. He refers to this fallen angel as she. He's not talking about Rihanna. When you read the words, he's talking about a demonic entity. But that's what the young people listen to. Stairway to Heaven is one of those records that when it was played backward, it was a satanic chant. It was a satanic praise in reverse. But it was called Stairway to what? Heaven. Let me go on. There's another one. There's a Led Zeppelin album. Look at this picture. You see the third eye right there? I accented it a little bit more so you can see it. The third eye. There's the third eye teaching as seen on this album by Led Zeppelin. The third eye ties back to the empty promise that the devil made to Eve in the Garden of Eden. He said, your eyes will be open. You'll be like God, knowing good and evil. Look at this quotation. The third eye, also known as the inner eye, is a mystical and esoteric concept referring in part to the ajna, or the brow. It is also spoken of as the gate that leads within to the inner realms and spaces of higher consciousness. The third eye is often associated with visions or inner visions, clairvoyance, precognition, and out-of-body experiences. In Hinduism and Buddhism, the third eye is a symbol of enlightenment. In the Indian tradition, it is referred to as the eye of knowledge. Where did Satan meet Eve? At the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Let me go on. Look at this next one. The eye of enlightenment as declared by Kanye West. Don't go away from this picture very quickly. Kanye West, he wanted his eyes to look that way so people can know that he is connected to the Illuminati. And he had a video called Power. See that big old dynamic icon that's a chain hanging around his neck? The eye of Horus, that Egyptian god. He made it very clear that his allegiance was to a different source other than the source that we give our allegiance to. He's connected to the Illuminati. Here's another picture coming after this that talks about that. This was the shortest hip-hop video ever made, a minute and 43 seconds long. How many songs are a minute and 43 seconds? But this is an entire video based on the, uh, masonry and the Illuminati allegiance. Everything about it had the mason symbols in it. 
You study that, it's put together in detail. I don't have time to cover that right now. Look at this next picture. You see on the right and left, two albino angels with the horns of Baphomet. And the reason I cut the picture off where I did, notice all the columns, the symbols of masonry. When you study masonry, you'll discover columns are huge. Columns are huge in masonry and the study of it. But the two Baphomet horns, they're showing that his allegiance, he's standing between two satanic goats. And I cut that picture off because that picture was too offensive. In that world is seduction and sensuality. You know, Christians shouldn't, should not dress to look sensual. We, women should dress to look godly. You go to some of our churches nowadays, guys got to wear black glasses because the women being molded by that industry don't have mercy even on the Sabbath. Guys go to church trying to find Jesus and can't even, can't even look around the church building. But let me go on further. Look at another one. Michael Jackson's. These are, these are Masonic art here, just showing you the checkerboard, the black and white checkers, the columns there. Those are Masonic symbols. If you study into that, you'll begin to see clearly that is prevalent. And wherever you begin to see that, you know that the Masons are involved. Here's an album, uh, album cover of Michael Jackson. It's called Blood on the Dance Floor. Michael Jackson dancing on black and white checkers, clearly indicating his connection with the Illuminati, the Masonic order. Here's another one coming right after this. Uh, Kanye West and Jay-Z in concert together. You see that big old amulet he has around his neck that's swinging back and forth? He's saying to his concert goers, yes, I'm singing in, in place of the God of Horus. I'm here to represent Satan and let me sing a song to you. These are both connected in that masonry connection. Very amazing, but it doesn't stop there. There's an entire audience that's publicly declaring their allegiance to the devil. I'm going to go even faster. Look at this next one. It's not just in the English world. Here's a group, a Latino group called Menudo. Look at the title of their album. Lost. And young people are listening to that stuff. That's why in their minds they're lost. Let's keep going. Let me shock you a little bit today. Some people that, they, I like Celine Dion singing, but Celine Dion is a part of the industry too. How do you get to Las Vegas and sell out for every night for six months in a row in the city of sin? You think you're going to be selling out six months in a row in the city of sin if you have not made some kind of agreement with the Lord of Darkness? Well, let's keep going. Uh, Mariah Carey and Kelly Clarkson clearly declaring, they're the hand signals. Kelly Clarkson, she was one of the winners on American Idols about five or seven years ago. I can't remember exactly when. The Baphomet sign, yes, I'm connected to the devil. Here it is. Check me out. And the next graphic, I appreciate Will so much. This is Sasha Fierce, the altar, the altar personality of Beyonce Knowles. There she is on her head, making the sign of the goat's horns on the side of her head. And one of the reasons why many of you probably wonder, why did not I have more pictures of Beyonce? Because they're not decent, that's why. You can't put something up there. I want somebody with hardly nothing on on our screens in our church. Amen? See, the bottom line is, Satan will... Get you to try to do what he tried to do if you follow him on that path. He'll lead you to try to do what he did. He said, I will be like the Most High. Get this very quickly. Jesus, the Lion of the tribe of Judah. Satan, the Roaring Lion. Jesus, the Brazen Serpent. Satan, the Serpent of old. Jesus, the Light of the World. Satan, an Angel of Light. Look at this one. There's the Illuminati departure from the Walk of Fame. This is the ultimate this is the ultimate. I am. Who does the title I am belong to? God Almighty. But Beyonce has a tour called the I Am Tour. No, you ain't. It's only Jesus. When Moses asked the question, look at Exodus 3, verse 13 and 14. Moses said, when he went to Pharaoh, Indeed, when they come, when I come to the children of Israel and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they ask, say to me, what is his name? What shall I say to them? And God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, Thus you shall say to the children of Israel, I am has sent you. Nowadays, music artists worshiping the devil calling themselves I am. But it even gets worse than that. Here's another one that I call the pretender to the throne. His name is Will I Am. The head of the music group Black Eyed Peas. Will, I am. Let's break that down. I am. Will. The word Philema. That's why he broke his name down that way. Will. Studying and understanding your will. Accomplishing it. So he's sporting that in young people. Oh, Black Eyed Peas. Yeah, he'll end up, take the peas out. He'll end up with a black eye. That's what will happen, actually. Here's another one. This is the ultimate, this is the ultimate disgrace. Jay-Z 
DJ Storm presents Jehovah, the God MC. Can you imagine a man calling himself the God MC? Lord, have mercy. Amen. Now, brothers and sisters, the worldly industry has influenced the Christian music industry even still. They've even gone deeper. Why on earth are there Christian awards? How on earth can you give me an award for something that only God can judge? I mean, how can you tell? Have you interviewed those who have cha been changed by the music I sang? Have you interviewed those who have been led to Jesus by the songs in the quote-unquote Christian industry? You cannot give me an award if I'm not singing for your glory. I'm singing for the glory of God. I've never heard about a song that saves people, but I heard about somebody called Jesus. And Matthew says, call his name Jesus. He shall save his people from their sins. So brethren, let me end on this point. I don't need an Oscar. I don't need a Dove Award, an Angel Award, a Grammy Award, an American Music Award, or a Lifetime Achievement Award. I want the award that Paul the Apostle wants. He says in 2 Timothy 4 and verse 8, Finally, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, not American Idol judges, not American Music Award judges, but the righteous judge, will give to me on that day, and not to me only, but also to all who have loved his appearing. Somebody ought to say amen. amen. That's who I'm singing for. I may not make it on the top ten chart, but I'm planning on making it to heaven. Amen. And I'm going to say to those young people that are involved in this industry, you may wonder, Pastor John, you've been talking about so much, what do I do? If you turn your life over to Jesus, he'll do the rest. Amen. Do like I did when I was a young man. I gave my life to Jesus. I had over 400 albums. I got rid of them all, and my very first album was a Heritage Singers album. God's got a wonderful sense of humor. <laughs> Never knew that he was giving me a sign that one day I would be singing with the Heritage Singers. Now I'm singing for the glory of God. I don't care about the fame of the world, brethren. The walk of fame is not going to end up as the walk of shame for me. I'm going to give God the glory, and I pray that those of you who have this in your home, in your life... Get together with your children, find out what they're listening to, and begin to mold them for the kingdom of God. Forget about their independence. Train them up in the way they should go, so that when they get older, they are a glory to God. Praise the Lord for that. And so, friends, we must go at this time, but I look forward to seeing you this afternoon for the final presentation. God bless you until I see you then. Amen.